You're listening to Nerds Out of Water with Michael Lobb and David Kemis. Nerds Out of Water is a podcast brought to you by myself, Michael Lobb, and David Kamis. Uh, well, both of us when I am actually on the podcast, which I wasn't last week. We're two good friends who have partnered for around 20 years. I run a company called TeamScale, which provides trusted technology advice to solution. David runs One Bright Cloud, where he heads up a team of techs and futurists looking at autonomous vehicles, AI, and digital transformation as a prerequisite for Industry 4.0. Nice of you to come back this week, Michael. Nice of you to make the time for us. <laughs> Michael runs TeamScale, providing trusted technology and advice and solutions to companies having trouble scaling up. He enables those businesses to grow and keep their technologies on track. We challenge your own perspectives and try to see things from each other's perspective. You don't need to agree, but after listening to this show, you'll definitely have an idea about my dog barking in the background. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was pretty busy last week. I'm sorry about that. But uh, that's okay. Anything exciting you want to share with us? Oh, we I spoke a lot about the cybersecurity stuff that's happening at the present time and the attacks that are going on. I think I will just mention a little bit of that that later because there are some updates. And I'm really looking forward to having a cybersecurity expert coming on. I believe you've invited someone. Yeah, if I can get that working. Um, I also wanted to talk about facial recognition, which is something that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, I think IBM and Google and a few other companies are actually stopping government using facial recognition technology for mass surveillance. And we're, you know, we're talking about some technology that can identify people based on their face, basically. So, you know, there's CCTV cameras everywhere in the world now, everywhere in any city, at least. What do you think about that? Do you think that governments should be able to use facial technology, to facial recognition technology to identify people, where they are and what they're doing? Well, there's two different questions there. One, should governments use facial technology um, and should governments use the IBM facial technology? Uh, lots of different questions coming out of there because why aren't they allowing them? And it's probably similar to Google having a, a step in as well at times. But I think facial technology should be used. We, we are in a space now where we have to keep on top of the bad boys and the bad guys and the bad girls. And facial recognition is one of the tools that we should be using. And it measures distances between your ears and your eyes and your nose and your mouth. And it doesn't matter how old you get, it, it'll actually take your references on as you move up the age. And passports, passport control, they're using it. Mm. And that's, I guess, one of the arguments that they've got is that facial recognition is everywhere already. So you know, let's just expand that out. Now, I, I don't like the idea of it. I mean, uh, what I see is a is the version of personal scoring where they see you going into, say, you know, a store that you shouldn't be going into and mark you down a score and then start, you know, giving you scores for going to church on Sunday, for example, or whatever those things that you that are deemed morally the right things to be doing. And I get the, the vibe that we're dangerously close to an to a 1984 scenario where you know we're we're being monitored for things that perhaps the government is telling us are good, but we don't get to decide for ourselves whether it's good or not. And then implementing things like travel bans for people whose score are be is below a certain amount. Yes and no. Um, should we do go down that path? No, I don't think we should go down that path to the degree that you're thinking, even though I do know of several countries in the world who are already implementing that. Mm -hmm. um, should it be used by the police and the intelligence services? Yeah, I think it should. I, I think we have a duty of care to look after our civilians to uh, against the bad people. And without that, without the facial technology, there'll be many incidents that take place that we would have no idea about. Mm. And my counter argument to that is the police in some countries haven't been as uh, 
morally justified in some of their actions as they would in, say, a country like Australia. Yeah. Now, but that's that's another question all over again. So you need to make sure that your police are ha- have the morals and have the training to be able to use that in a way that doesn't create conflict internally. And, and let's let's face facts: uh, it, intelligence agencies are using this anyway. Yep. IBM I'm gonna, aren't going to stop them using that. They will use it. They have probably better solutions than we do. So um, what we're talking about is pushing this into more civilian uh, circumstances where police can use it or or, com- or companies that are doing security on behalf of the government or on behalf of the citizens of a country can use this in order to manage crime, terrorism, things like that. So what about reducing the um, reducing the fights that go on in rugby and football matches? What about facial recognition inside there, which is heavily used at the moment? Mm. Um, I kind of maybe I live in a bit of a utopian uh, idealist uh, mindset. If you're having fights at football matches and rugby games, then, you know, you're an idiot. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, So I'm working with a company at the moment who are producing facial recognition and heat recognition software. And this is to not only look at the temperature of people going into football matches, restaurants, etc., but it's also being used as recognition of the face rather than using touch cards or palm prints or alike. Mm. And that means there's a hands-off it's like when you go through the toll bridge and it recognizes your yeah. license plate yep. rather than having a have, having to pay pay a coin into the slot. Mm. Mm. So basically what it's saying what you're saying is the your face will become your identifier. Yep. Well, I think your face is already starting to become your identifier. As we start moving away from a monetary system, which we are, we're going to, in my lifetime, I believe we're going to leave dollars and coins and notes and coins behind, and it'll be somehow just moved from bank to bank. And whether that's a palm print or a thumbprint, which I don't think it'll be now because of COVID-19 is changing the world. So it's got to be something else. Is it iris scanning? Is it facial recognition? We spoke about this last week. It has to be multiple levels of uh, of uh, yes identification. Agreed. I mean, you know, authentication. Sorry, you know, you can't just rely on your face because no, you can't. I guess it's not going to necessarily. You need an identifier. You need your face as a as a, as one component, and maybe an iris scan, or maybe a, maybe a a pin number of some sort that yeah. you know changes every fifteen seconds. I think you'd have to have a three three point. If you're going to pay using facial recognition or alike, you'll need a three-point uh, approval because, and coming from three completely separate systems, um, as we spoke about last week, facial identifiers are being hacked already over in the US. So mm. if they're already being hacked, then we need alternative sources to prove who you are coming from a completely different source. Do you use your face when you're doing uh, payment, Google payment? No, I don't. I use my thumbprint. Mm. Um, I actually find using the facial recognition on my phone, um, it gives my it gives me a headache when I stare into it. Mm? Yeah. Really? Maybe it's just my concentration. <laughs> I have my Google tablet won't allow me to do facial recognition because I wear glasses and it doesn't recognize me with glasses. And the same at the airport when I go through security, I have to take my glasses off. Now, I my eyesight is not so good. And when I take my glasses off, I can't see stuff. So I look at the light and then it tells me some instructions and I can't read them. And then someone comes over and says, oh, you can go now. And it's like, if I could just leave my glasses on, that would be a lot easier. I could read the instructions. But uh, the Apple facial recognition for Apple Pay allows me to look at or it doesn't even I don't even need to look at my phone and get a headache. I just open my credit, open my um, credit card and pay. And it sees my photo or sees my face and recognizes me and pays. And you heard that here first. Mm. I used to use my thumbprint. Michael opens his credit card, is in buying and is buying today's dinner. <laughs> so I guess I guess I do use facial recognition for that stuff and I don't trust it, but, you know. Hmm. One of the reasons you don't allow glasses is because you can actually change the way your eyes look when you've got glasses. You can put somebody else's eyes on. So that's why they make you take the glasses off. Great. Well, <laughs> still can't read the instructions. <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> Maybe. Well, that's a very good point. Why aren't they being spoken? Why aren't they verbal? Yeah, what, the instructions 
you know, okay, you can move through now. Or yes, you can put your glasses back on now. It, uh, is a look up a little bit, look down a little bit. Mm, exactly, but you know, I tend to always have to go through the manual person looking at my photo and then wondering why my passport photo looks nothing like me, and then going, "Oh, okay, yeah, you are who you say you are," and then I can go through. So you started this saying you don't want facial recognition. You've ended this saying, I use facial recognition. Where are you up to? No, no, I don't think facial recognition should be used by law enforcement to manage the population of a country into the way that the government sees that they should be pushed. I don't agree with uh, a system that is in some countries, as you mentioned, where scoring comes in because they recognise a person and recognise that they're doing something that is against what the government believes is morally correct. That must be highly, highly critical. critical, No, that must be critically available to be hacked, in my opinion. Mm. And, and, you know, you think about the protests that are happening in the US at the moment for Black Lives Matter. The people that were there had facial recognition being in place. Um, what they were doing was essentially against what the government believed was morally correct and what the health department believed was morally correct and so well, correct in some ways because COVID-19, you know, they should have been social distancing and everything like that. So those people who were justified in their protests and doing the right thing were still doing the wrong thing according to the government and therefore there would have been 80,000 arrests in each city. Yeah. You know, um, I, I believe that people have the right to be able to make their own decisions based on their, you know, their, um, their moral beliefs. But the moment it turns violent, then I think... That's different, yeah. We should be able to take facial recognition and pick up only those who are being violent. So you think it's more like a phone tap? You have to get your, yeah. you know, you have to get a, a warrant to yeah. enable you, enable to find out who it is, yep. At what point do we say to the public, you're able to be recognized and we're able to see what you are doing and we're, we are able to find out what it is that you're doing so that we can make an, make a judgment on whether you're doing the right thing or not. So most shopping centers now, most most big shops use one of the um, AI t- safe uh, security, which is all has facial recognition. Mm-hmm. And you download your facial recognition files from, um, from facial recognition servers that are scattered around the world. So you can actually pull people's facial recognition and buy that online. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So, I mean, that that leads us back into the other side of things. Should private enterprises be able to use facial recognition to to do things that potentially you don't want to happen? For example, you don't, don't, I mean, you don't have, you don't have the right to say, no, I don't want my face scanned when I walk in here. Yep. By walking into a shopping mall, you are inherently giving them the right to scan you yep. and to show, you know, to, to use your face as data. So therefore, um, do we consent as a nation to giving private enterprises our identity to do with what they want? And I know that what they're going to be doing is, tr- is trying to advertise to you and trying to push you in a direction and trying to manipulate you into buying certain products and services. Is that okay? I don't think it is. So um, there is now marketing billboards that market based on your facial recognition. There are billboards already out there. Sure, I don't think that. I don't. I don't think that's right. So that takes it back to Facebook. I think we should incite a riot and burn them down. That takes. Oh, that takes you back to Facebook and marketing on Facebook and the AI that's behind that, and which you don't use. Facebook, you have to sign into. Oh. You have to make a concerted judgment, as in today, I'm going to sign into Facebook. You can also block the pixels that you that Facebook uses, so that they can't tell you tell where you've been. You don't have that at capability in a shopping center because you know you just want to go and get your yes you can you know get your you just don't go you go to a separate shop a facial recognition free shop so maybe that should be a thing maybe you should have a standard where you know you can put a sticker on the door that says we don't use facial recognition to advertise to you here and we don't use facial recognition to watch out for the nasty people or or do we walk around with masks oh there's something i could say there actually that's a good point how does facial recognition deal with face masks it doesn't okay so there you go that's how you do it folks well now we've got the movie where they're pulling skins off of people and putting faces somebody else's face onto their face that was like that wasn't now that was like 20 years ago with what uh, Nicolas Cage and yes. uh, John Travolta that's right face off <laughs> wow that was deep and meaningful
Thanks for bringing that one in. Yeah, well, we went from we went from uh, gr- you know semi semi okay nineties movies to <laughs> to uh, governments government uh, using facial recognition for morally justified purposes or morally unjustified. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it where I, I believe facial recognition should be used anywhere, and I think it's open because it will be an open point. And you're going to leave it at. I don't believe it should be, but I don't think we've got a choice in the matter. Yeah. Moving on from there. So, moving on from there, people are going to start. <laughs> people are going to start using facial technology to facial recognition technology to do what? <laughs> well, the there are drones over in Turkey um, that are called the Kamikaze drones, and they have got five hundred new Kamikaze drones on top of their four hundred already. So that's nearly a thousand Kamikaze drones. They all use facial recognition mm-hmm. or spatial recognition to attack Mm. and they're all autonomous they're all you got individual ai once they're launched they can be completely on an autonomous mode and they will attack with no with no barrier Mm. in other words you cannot stop them once they go you can't without physical means or there's no abort button there's no abort button wow that's pretty scary stuff so you could have a thousand drones attacking you and these aren't little ones these aren't my little swarm drones where they're only probably three or four centimeters uh, uh, inches wide these are two or three feet wide a meter wide they're big they ha- carry a heavy payload and they can destroy easily right so yeah wouldn't stand a chance unless you've got an ai drone swarm to combat them well that's where we that's where we're going to end up we're going to end up with swarms attacking swarms mm. and but scarily you know we go back to the video that was released in 2017 i think where the little swarm drones attack a university to find six or seven people that were theoretically uh, going to attack the university and they take them out with pellet munitions mm. um, but this is taking it to the next level yeah and this is swarm drone warfare isn't it yeah yeah, this is this is really big stuff, and having so many in Turkey is, is just a little bit scary. I think I think that if Turkey are getting them, the countries around Turkey are getting them, and it'll just start a, a tsunami. It'll start the the arms war again, won't it? Like you know, we've got bigger nukes than you. We've got bigger nukes here. No, we've got bigger nukes than you. Now it's we've got more agile swarm drones than you. Yeah, our swarm drones carry these missiles. Our swarm drones carry freaking lasers. And these swarm drones, by the way, they can go at a height level that they're not picked up by radar. Mm, of course they can. Yeah, I don't want to be. <sighs> I don't want to be around those if they attack. I, I'm very anxious about this whole direction, and I know that I am a swarm drone person. I play. A around in this all the time but i think this is now becoming a reality and we need to think about it and major cities um all around the world including uh power stations including water supplies all need to start thinking how they're going to protect themselves against swarm drones yeah exactly there's there's there is a level of a military protection that you need from if you're a Hmm. target like that because you know there's there's missiles but they're you know they're pointed and fired and you know they've got some targeting but these are swarm drones they these are drones that you know they they can go they're agile they can go in any direction they can you know they're small small enough to get into certain places as you said we can't see them coming and even if we do if there's a hundred of them what do we do you know we shoot down 99 but one of them gets through so we've been working with um two different companies one from france and one from israel and they both do anti-swarm drone technologies Mm. and we're not talking about a guy holding a net firing a net we're talking major reduction in swarm drone so as they come in they're actually rejected at a at a set several points as they uh, come in we've done a number of uh trials on this and it's been going quite well would would an emp work a targeted emp a targeted emp would work but then you have the problem of where where it will go and ha- what it would land on. You need to think about where the drone will be landing if it's if it's got its power supply removed. Mm. And would an EMP stop a a gas turbine type engine? Are you telling me there's gas turbine drones? These ones aren't. There are drones out there that are non electrical. Yes. But all of their control systems would be electrical. All the control, their AI must be electrical. Yes. They wouldn't have clock 
clockwork AI. Clockwork AI. There's a new capability. Oh, but <laughs> where, where would you go? I think this is. A, I think this is a really fun subject um, that is turning into a, a, a reality, and it's quite a scary reality. And just I've got a picture in front of me now of a of a whole probably fifty or sixty of these kamikaze drones, and they're not little things. The cameras on them are probably better than any of the cameras I've got, and the payload that they're carrying is about three or four kilos. Wow. Puts uh, the Boston Dynamic dogs to shame. Yeah, it puts my little drones to shame too. And I thought I had some pretty decent drones. But, okay, now, Swarm Drone. There is a new gameplay, and I know that we don't play games much, but, but, um, um, but one of the entertainment, the Astragon, Astragon Entertainment, have released a new drone swarm game. And I am actually looking forward to it being released and coming out because I'm going to play this for a little while to see if it is real. You get to control multiple sets of swarm drones. Mm. So they're gamifying uh, the sw- swarm drone warfare or just yeah. for entertainment purposes? No, they're gamifying swarm drone warfare. Now, wow. think about this. When we um, have fixed wing drones flying, a lot of the time we use Xbox-like controllers. Mm, of course. If we wanted to teach children how to control a swarm drone, so that when they're older, we can pick the best of the best for the military purposes. Where do we start? I think... Xbox controllers. Xbox controllers and kids playing games. Very, very interesting. Well, I mean, it's it's very much like flight simulator in the eighties, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, you've you've got a flight simulator on your you know brand new Commodore sixty four, and you you know you, and using that, you can learn how to fly a plane. Yeah. So mm, that's uh, to me that is absolutely scary it's kind of bordering on making me want to run to the hills and build a bunker i agree i I wouldn't mind building a bunker but if you have little no i'm not even going to go there (sighs) yeah Uh, i mean this sort of stuff is scary and i think i i do i do i know i have a naive and utopian mindset but I kind of I enjoy the uh, the entertainment value of drones and things like that, and I think that there's some really amazing uses for getting you know uh, emergency equipment to people in in hard to reach places. For getting you know there was someone who was rescued the other day in Australia by dropping a an inflatable uh, buoy out into the water and by a drone, and that that to me is an insanely great use of the technology, but. When we turn our uh, minds to how are we going to blow up the other people, it, that scares me. Yeah. And in Rwanda, they deliver nearly all blood through drones. Mm. They, it's an amazing capability they're doing. Uh, over in Southampton in the UK, they're just about to start running bloods from Southampton across the Isle of Wight. And I know there are plenty of drone trials similar to that that are being reviewed over in Australia. Mm. Um, an interesting one is the drone trial that's just finishing up in Canberra yeah. that delivers tea, coffee, books, um, and alike, and such as the library one that you were talking about mm, okay. in the US last week, I think, or two weeks ago. And they have now got permission to fly in 15 suburbs in Brisbane. Well, I don't live in Brisbane, so. So your pizza will be delivered by drones shortly. Your remote, you, you, you'll you get your yours delivered by uh, drone, yeah. Brisbane and the Gold Coast. Yeah. Oh, and rural... <laughs> With, they'll they'll drop it with a with a parachute on it. Yeah, I'll get mine delivered by fixed wing probably because the drones won't have the flight time to get out here. Look, um, David, I know you've been. I know you know you talked about this last week, and we talked about it the week before. But you know, uh, we we've been running a I guess a kind of uh, series of be kind to your mind uh, discussions. Um, you wanted to talk about your you know family during this COVID nineteen uh, pandemic and how that affects your mental health as well. Yep, yep. So we, our first story on this was be kind to your mind. So look after you you, and look after yourself while in lockdown, while going back to work. Last week, we spoke about mm. be kind to your mind from a manager point of view, because a manager has a duty of care to look after people. And looking after people now is different. Things are very different when you go back to the workplace and managers have to understand that. And I thought this week we'd turn this on to the family and we'll have a couple of touch points with be kind to your mind from your family. And I, I think we, we can just go through it. And th- these aren't 
all mine. Obviously, I'm pulling these from a number of different sources. But a number one, take care of yourself because without yourself being healthy, you can't help other people. So do the typical Oh, wash the hands, <laughs> clean up. Put the toilet seat down. Keep everything tidy and clean and exercise so you're healthy. Um, listen and put your toilet seat down and the toilet lid down. Mm. Now I'm going to uh, change the subject here slightly. Mm. Do you remember one of our very first podcasts when we were talking about cleaning phones? Yeah. So This was before COVID-19. So these UV phone cleaners are selling out probably a little bit faster than toilet paper did a few months ago. Um, I was looking on Amazon and it's, you know, the phone cleaners are probably, you know, in the top 10 selling devices and gadgets and, and you, you know, it's like, really? So you put your phone into this little device and it goes and cleans your phone using UV light. I, I don't know how, uh, how hygienic they are or whether there's any studies into whether, you know, the, the Chinese made, um, UV phone cleaner from Amazon that costs you $3.98 plus postage and handling is going to do any good to save you from uh, getting, you know, bad stuff on your hands. Yeah. Anyway, let's move from Chinese UV into back to be kind to your mind for the family. So take care of yourself, listen to others and talk as if you want to be heard and make sure that other people get hurt, have their right to speak to you because everyone has a mental requirement to be listened to. Mm. Teach emotional choice. Now, everybody has various moods and you and I, we never get out of sync with each other. We're always completely feelings connected. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. No, that's good. Um, so <laughs> as, as a person in your family, model behaviours that, that have respect and encourages other people to feel correct and feel right. Um, generosity, make everyone feel like they're giving, make sure that everyone has the opportunity to give and take responsibility for your communications. Now, I'm quite poor at that particular one. I tend to look, watch the news and go, I can't believe what they're doing this time. How dare they do that in front of the kids? And that is probably not the best thing that the kids need to hear when they're listening to the news. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, we, I, I'm a very quiet person. I don't know if you knew that, but sometimes I'll just sit there and I'll, and I'll get lost in my own thoughts and I'll giggle or laugh or something like that. And the people around me might think that I'm laughing at them, but I'm not. It's just some random shit that came into my head and, and I was laughing at, at that. Like, like, you know, maybe I'm thinking of a unicorn with wings or, you know, a purple, uh, a purple sandwich, something like that. And it's like, <laughs> and then everyone around me goes, oh man, what, what's he laughing at? Did I, did I just do something stupid? But mm, no, I often live inside my own head and, and often I don't hear what people are saying because I'm in my own thoughts and, you know, that can be irritating to people. So, you know, if, if I'm, I, if I'm listening to, if I'm listening to someone, I'm listening to them, but if I'm in my own head, sometimes I just don't get don't get out of my own head until someone says, hey, are you listening to me? This time it's my turn to say, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you, you've, we've all struggled at um, varying times over the last period. Um, last week for me was hard on Sunday because it was um, Father's Day in the UK and I was meant to be over there for my mm. dad who's in his 90s and I, I'm hoping to God he'll last another year so at least I can get there. Um, it was quite hard seeing him um, and speaking to him, especially as he always calls me my brother, um, which is very hard. Uh, but anyway, um, have you got any thoughts on other things people need to do from a family perspective? Look, I, I believe that um, our family unit is different to most people's. Uh, I think for me, I need space and and for my partner, she needs people around. So it's that, you know, that can get kind of difficult to manage. Um, I, I just think understanding each other's needs is a really important thing. Yeah. Understanding everyone's needs. You know, you mentioned before, you know, where you can yell at the, yell at the news and the kids pick up on that. Um, explaining stuff is, is really important to me. You know, I, I, I was yelling because I'm frustrated at this particular thing might be a better conversation than just yelling at it and then walking away. Um, I don't know, but for me, understanding is really important and we've got, uh, we've got a duty to look after our families during this time as well. I mean, people are starting to go back to work and I was talking to someone this morning about, you, you know, there, there are people in the, in the, in Australia that are, that have been locked up working together 
in the same house for for months and they don't necessarily have the understanding to to know what each other's work work patterns are like because they've never worked with these people before they might come home and have uh you know have coffee together and have dinner together and look at look raise the kids together but working together is a whole different thing and that mm. that's mm. going to change the dynamics in the company i mean in the household the other thing is um people who spend a lot of time together um you know, if they go out and do certain things, like they're going out to a cafe with their friends or whatever, they they come back, they have a have a cup of tea with their with their family, and they they've got something to talk about. They go to work the next day, they they come home, and they've got something to talk about. Now, because they're always in each other's face, they've never got anything to talk about, and that you know that it's a really interesting thing. There's no more experiences that they can pick up because they they're all experiencing it together. So you know, those those are the sorts of things that that I would think so. Wow, it's very good. It's very good point. Very good point indeed. Now, I would like to um, go on. The other thing that I wanted to mention is about mistakes because we all we all screw up sometimes and uh, owning up to the fact that you've made a mistake is sometimes important. Um, you know, I, I do it at work a lot. Don't, I don't make any mistakes at work, but I'll own up to mistakes that I, if I make them. I think, I think it's very important that we do own up because making a mistake is just one way of um, learning. And I, I believe everybody is capable of learning and I believe everyone has to make mistakes to get to this point of where they can. Mm. And in a family situation, that's no different. Mm. Absolutely not. Thanks for listening to Nerds Out of Water. We appreciate you spending the time with us. And um, as usual, if you want to listen to more, click the subscribe button in whatever podcasting tool you are using or on YouTube, if it's on YouTube. Um, give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Yeah, give us a thumbs up. Tell us what you think. Yeah, I'd like to hear some people who disagree with us. Tell us we're wrong. <laughs> I want to I want to hear. I want to see some trolls on our... <laughs> Um, David, I'm really excited because I'm actually doing a, a series of webinars in a month or so that is about business change in technology um, projects. That's excellent. And uh, I'll be put posting some more information as it comes to light. So keep an eye out for that because it'll be really interesting to um, sign up for that and come along and it'll be a lunchtime session. So, you you know, at, if you're at work, you can, you know, spend 30, 30 40 minutes with us and have a chat. Great. Um, thanks, David. Appreciate your time. Uh, let's talk again soon. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate yours. Look after yourself. Stay safe. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.